And I want to thank God this morning for all of you for being in the house of the Lord this morning. Because this is the day the Lord has made. And the song says, and the word says, I will rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. And so I'm rejoicing this morning because I'm in this day that the Lord has made. And the Lord has allowed me to be here with you. And he has blessed us one more time to come and to give him all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. Amen. And we've been learning in our, in our Christian education about charity, and we are focusing on spiritual charity um, versus natural charity. And we've been talking about or touching on a little bit about the fruit of the Spirit. So the scriptures that we're going to be coming from today, background scriptures are in 1 Corinthians, um, over in 1 Corinthians 13. I ask that you would turn there. And we also may have an opportunity to go over to Galatians, the fifth chapter, and round about verse 22. Um, but we'll see what the Spirit gives us in, in this time. Uh, but we're going to start off in 1 Corinthians 13, and I'm going to get there myself. And in 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, we have Paul as our off, off, author this morning. And uh, I, I love how Paul writes, and I say this quite frequently, but I love how he writes because um, if you go to any particular scripture, whether he's talking to the Corinthians, he's talking to the Ephesians, he's talking to the saints at Coloss, um, he may write in he may write the same thing a different way, but it has the same meaning. And he will do that by the Spirit as, as the Spirit leads him to give unto them what it is that they need at that time, even though it's the same thing in a lot of instances, but certain people can only take things a certain way. Does that make sense? And so his writings to the saints in Corinth may be a little bit different from what he wrote over in, in Galatians, but the messages are pretty synonymous, um, give or take a, you know, a few things, of course. But over in 1 Corinthians 13, Paul starts off in chapter 1, I mean verse 1 and 13, and he says, though I speak, and this may sound like review for some of you, I encourage you, as I have been recently, to hear the word as if you've never heard it before. There is a blessing in hearing the word of God like you never heard it before. And I encourage you to come in to the, to the Christian education with your cups empty this morning. Amen? Amen. Amen. In 1 Corinthians 13 and 1, I'm just going to put down my, three, my theme scriptures on the board. 13 and 1, in case you want to take notes. Um, and if you can give... Um, if you have a notebook or a pen for, for the brothers, if you could. 1 Corinthians 13 and 1 is background scripture, Galatians 5 and 22 through 23 is other background scriptures this morning, amen? And so, <clears throat> I'll go to 1 Corinthians 13. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or tinkling cymbal. And Paul is saying here, <clears throat> and in my Bible, I have a Dakes, uh, King James Version Bible, <clears throat> and it says the gifts, it's a subheading, it says the gifts are valueless unless exercised in love. And it's not talking about the love that you have for a man or a woman, but Paul is talking about agape love or godly love. And so whatever we do in the church, Paul is saying one of the things, you know, and you can do this at home, you can speak in tongues. You know, when you pray in the church, when you are at home, you can speak in tongues. But he says, if you do that and you don't have charity or if we don't have charity, he said that we become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And, you know, when you think about music, um, there are certain instruments that make certain sounds and that are more distinct than others. And when he's talking about sounding brass or tinkling cymbal, it could be likened unto you hear those sounds, but are they effective in producing the notes and the quality of the music that should be heard? Amen? And so Paul is saying here that I might speak in tongues. He said I might speak in tongues, 
He said, but what is that profiting? If I don't do it with the love of God shed abroad in my heart by the Holy Ghost, and that's intertwining Romans, because Paul also wrote Romans. Amen? Amen? So, starting off the bat, if I'm going to speak in the heavenly language, am I doing it with the right motive? Am I doing it with the right mind? Why do I want to speak in this heavenly language, in these tongues? What is the goal in this? Is it to just edify or comfort and exhort and build up myself? Or is it to engage in doing this so that I can speak in those in that heavenly language so that God can speak to me through the Spirit so that I might be a blessing not only to myself and receive a blessing for myself, but for somebody else. We're talking about charity this morning. Spiritual charity, amen? amen. And so Paul is the type of writer and the type of apostle that he really makes us examine ourselves where we are in the faith or if we're trying to make a decision to be in the faith. Paul makes us take a step back and do some self-introspection to decide on why we're going to do what it is that we're embarking on doing. Or even if you're already doing it, Paul gives you the front and center opportunity to make a decision so that way, if we're already doing these things, we can look at our approach. We can look at our motives. We can look at our whys. We can look at all these different things so that we are not being as a sounding brass or tinkling cymbal. In other words, are we doing it in vain? Amen? Amen. We're all in the house of God this morning. But why are we here? I don't believe that I came to see anybody's outfit this morning. I don't believe that I came in order to um, check a box this morning. Because there's many other things that I could be doing on a Sunday morning. But I'm doing what I'm doing because I don't want to be a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And it's not in the eyes of man. Amen? I want to preface, it's not in the eyes of men. But it's in the eyes of the Lord. When Paul is talking here, he's not talking about sounding brass and tinkling cymbal because of uh, 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 Brother Greg. Because I'm concerned about Brother Greg thinking that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be doing this for the sake of just doing it. Or Brother Garrett, I'm just doing this in the sake of doing it. Because I'm concerned that Brother Garrett going to say something about me if I don't come to church this morning, right? Or Brother Garrett going to say something about me because, you know, I, I didn't show up at, at prayer, on noonday prayer on Saturday. Or I didn't do this or I didn't do that. So I am concerned about being a sound and brass or tinkling cymbal. So I'm going to check these boxes so that the saints don't talk about me. But what Paul is saying is that I don't want to become a sound and brass or tinkling cymbal in the eyes of the Lord. The Bible says, whatsoever you do, do it wholeheartedly as unto the Lord. Lord. Because he is the righteous judge, amen. amen. And he will requite thee, the word of God says. So he's the one that's going to judge me. Amen. So when I read the word of God, am I reading it and doing the things that as we go along here, I want you to think about this. Am I doing what I'm doing for or because I don't want to be a sounding brass or tinkling cymbal? For the peep amongst the people? Or am I doing what I'm doing because I don't want to be a sounding brass or tinkling cymbal in the eyes of the Lord? Amen. So my question to you this morning, why am I doing? And my handwriting is not the best, but why am I doing for those that want to take notes? Why am I doing what I am doing? Amen. Why am I doing what I'm doing? This is a big question. You know, a lot of times people say, well, you know, I'm trying to find my purpose and I'm trying to find this and that and so on and so forth. Our purpose is to serve the Lord. The Bible says over in John 18 and 37, Jesus says this. He says, for this cause was I born. And to this end came I into the world that I should bear witness of the truth. Amen. So while we're here, the cause that we're here the reason that we're here should be 
to bear witness of the truth. And who is the truth? Jesus Christ is the truth. And so, why are we doing what we're doing this morning? Amen. And I'll continue. Verse 2, 1 Corinthians 13 and 2 says, And though I have the gift of prophecy, and Paul just started giving a rundown of these different things he knew about himself. Amen. Paul was talking about himself at this particular juncture. And I love the fact that he was so open about himself because he realized that, you know what? I can't help nobody if I'm not aware of my own self. Sometimes we want to try to help somebody else have peace when we don't have peace. Sometimes we want to help somebody else have joy when we don't have joy. Sometimes we want to help others have the fruit of the spirit when we may not necessarily have it ourselves. But that doesn't mean that we should not desire it. Because Paul even said in 1 Corinthians, the 14th chapter, he told us to follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts. And when you're following after something, that means you're trying to catch up with it. You're trying to obtain it, right? you 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 following after it. David said in one place in scripture, he said that he would, his, his heart fainted, his heart panted after the, uh, the water like a deer. And I'm paraphrasing, but he was panting after it, looking after it, seeking after it, following after, as Paul said. So he says, though I have the gift of prophecy, Paul identified one of the gifts of the spirit that he had. He said, and understand all mysteries. So he said, look, I'm going to level with y'all. I have the gift of prophecy. He said, and I even understand all mysteries and all knowledge. And though I have all faith, Paul said another gift. He had the gift of faith. He said, so that I could remove mountains. He said, let me tell you how much faith I have. He says, and there's a caveat here, but if I don't have charity, I am nothing. Paul said, it doesn't matter how many gifts of the spirit that I'm walking in. Doesn't even matter at all. But if I don't have charity, this agape love, this love that comes from the father, that Jesus Christ asked that the Father would give me through the power of the Holy Spirit. If I don't have that love and I'm operating in all this stuff, all these gifts, all this, that, and the other, who is it going to profit? And then on top of that, not only who is it going to profit, but then on top of that, I walk around with all these gifts, but I'm really nothing. Amen? So Paul was very honest with the people and we have to be very honest with ourselves where we are in Christ because that is the only way that we're able to do his will. And I'm not talking about his permissive will either. I'm talking about the perfect will of the Father. Where are I have to ask myself, where am I in Christ? Why am I doing what I'm doing in the house of God? In, in Christ overall, what is my motive for serving the Lord? That's my second question. What is my motive for serving the Lord? And you don't have to answer me, but I want you to think about these things. What is my motive for serving the Lord? Amen? What is my motive for serving the Lord? You might say, well, Sister Pastor, I ain't, you know, I ain't really think Christian education was going to go in that direction. But this really helps us to get a good foundation in Christ. Because when you know why you're doing what you're doing, you can give it all you got. When you know why you're in this place, and not just physically, but I'm talking about in, your, in the place that you are in, in the spirit. Because a lot of times we liken what we're doing unto the location that we're in. And it doesn't mean that you shouldn't have respect to the house of God where you are. Because if that's what God planned you for such a time as this, then have respect unto that. Amen. And do what the Lord is calling you to do. But why am I doing what I'm doing? And what is my motive for serving the Lord? And many of us, when we came to the Lord, it could have been, you know, by nature of somebody else just bringing us as a child. Or it could have been that we had a need in our lives at the time that we needed the Lord to, to meet. I know that I had a need when I was invited to the house of God. I needed the Lord to work some things out and to work some things within. I had very selfish motives and reasons for why I needed to come to church. I'm just talking about me this morning. But God is so rich in mercy, the Bible says, that he was so gracious that whatever it took 
for him to get me to the house of God, he used it. And that was all right. Whatever it was that it took for him to allow to come into my life, to come my way, he used that very thing to order my steps so that I might be in his perfect will. Amen. And so Paul just says here, and though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor. Some people may have come to the house of God through a charitable organization. They may have come through to the house of God um, because they were providing services to a charitable organization. Paul's talking about feeding the poor. And though I give my body to be burned, in other words, Paul was saying, you know, I could be a living sacrifice, literally, and give my body to be burned. That's not what he's saying we should do, but he's saying, I could do that. But then he says, if I do all that, and then I don't have the love of God, charity. Then he says here, it profiteth me nothing. And then on top of that, it may profit others in a sense where he feeds the poor and that's a meal. But they're going to be hungry later. Amen? He could burn his body, you know, give his body to be offered or whatever the case may be. And I'll liken that into something else. You know, he could work himself to the ground. Just work himself to the ground. Just sacrificing his health and just working himself to death. But then it profits him nothing if he's not doing it in the love of God. Amen? Why am I doing what I'm doing this morning? What is my motive for serving the Lord? Charity, verse 4, suffereth long. And Paul began to realize some things after he began to talk about these things in verses 1 through 3. He began to think about some things concerning himself. Paul writes to the saint, but he is always reflecting upon himself. And he's saying what he's learned about himself in his writings. A lot of times we read the word of God, but we don't realize that what we are reading is based upon experience. And Paul talks about this in Romans, the fifth chapter. Patience work with experience and experience hope and hope maketh not ashamed. The first part of that, he says, though, is tribulation worketh patience. I'm going to flip over there real quick so that y'all can see I'm in the scripture. Romans 5. Amen. I believe Romans 5, starting in verse 1. I'm going to read that. Romans 5. And my subheading tells me it's tenfold result of justification by faith. And if we are serving the Lord for any other reason than purely having faith in God, then we want to check our motives. If we're serving him for any other reason besides wanting to make it to the city one day, New Jerusalem, heaven, yeah. as it's so called, then we want to check our motives. And you know it's okay that if you started out with one motive, but the God of mercy is able to change your mind. He's able to give you the right motive. He's able to give us the right mind. And then when he does that and he makes that mind different and he makes that mind to follow after him and he makes that mind to receive and follow after charity, then what he's done is, I'm going to read this, therefore being justified by faith. Because God turns our motives into faith. I'm going to say that again. God turns our motives into faith. I didn't start off seeking him because he was the God of heaven. I didn't have charity. I didn't start off seeking him because he was the righteous judge. I didn't have charity. I didn't start off serving him because he sent his son Jesus to be the, the propitiation, as the Bible says, for my sins. Because I didn't have charity. But now it says, therefore being justified by faith. Because he turned my sounding brass and tinkling cymbal into faith. And that takes time. I'm going to say, say that real quick before I dive into this scripture. scripture. Turning my motive into faith takes time. I'm going to tell you. Because what will happen is the enemy will try to make you feel as if, well, gosh, you know, Sister Pastor, my motive been wrong all this time. My, my, my reason for serving God has been absolutely opposite of what the word of God says. But God knows how to draw you. God knows how to bring you in. He knows how to wash you. He knows how to cleanse you. He knows how to sanctify you. He knows how to justify you. He knows how to purify you. 
He knows how to change your motive into faith. Amen? And it's through the word of God. And so it says, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace. When you are justified by faith, you will receive peace with God through his son Jesus, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Then it turns around and he gives us access in verse 2. Not only does he justify us by this faith because our motive is now turned into this faith, but he justifies us by this faith. Then he turns around and gives you peace through the Lord Jesus Christ. On top of that, giving you peace, he then turns around and says, by whom we also have access. We have access now because of this faith that he's changed from motive to faith. Amen? So he turns around and gives you access. There's a lot of things going on here. He turns around and says, access by faith. When you lose your faith, you lose your access. I know we're talking about charity this morning, but I'm going to write that on the board. And I'm going to get back over to 1 Corinthians 13. But when you lose your faith, Spirit said write that down. When you lose your faith, you lose access. You might say, well, I can go pray anytime I want to. But here's the thing. Your access may be lost for a little while because you, you and I decide to lay it down. But God always gives us an opportunity to pick it back up. Unless we blaspheme the Holy Ghost. Now, that's, that's a whole other topic. But when we lose our faith, we lose access to peace. We lose access to uh, the justification. We lose access to the things that God gives us, this agape love, this charity. We lay that thing on the side, and then we lose access. So when you lose your faith, you lose access. But you can't think in terms of, well, I've lost access. That's it. I'm, I'm over and out. I'm done. No, but what about the love of God? What about this agape love, this charity? What about that? The Bible says in Romans that he shed his love abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. We have access to go back and pick that back up. I don't care if you did something wrong last night, but you're in the house of God this morning. You have an opportunity to gain access. I don't care what it was. Unless you blaspheme the Holy Ghost, you still have opportunity to get this access because the love of God, this charity, it says here, and into this grace wherein we stand. So you have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. What are we standing in today? Are we standing in our own motives? Are we standing in this access that we have to this grace? Rejoice in hope of the glory of God. We have access to hope this morning. Amen. Charity gives us this hope. Charity gives us this justification. Charity gives us this peace. There's a lot of things that come with spiritual charity. You get more out of it than what you put in. Come on, y'all. Y'all be real with me this morning. You know, if you think about it, you have received more from God than what you put in. Come on now, Lee. We're going to get down real this morning. I want, I, I want, some, I want to see some smoke coming from y'all ears this morning. You have to think about this charity that God has, he has given us more than what we have put in. And the thing about it is he don't mind. He keeps doing it over and over. He keeps giving us access over and over. Even when we throw the key at him. Now y'all know some of us have thrown the key at God and walked off. We have turned our back, turned in the keys, and said, look, I'm walking out on this lease. I, 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 I'm walking out on this lease. I don't care if I got 12 more months on it. I, I don't care if it's an eternal lease. But I'm cutting the lease short, and I'm moving out. And here's my keys. And God is so gracious and so charitable and so loving. What he does, he turns around when we come to ourselves and we go back his way. And we knock on the door, because you know he's the leasing agent. And we go back, and we ask him, can we move back in? 
and he give us the keys and he begins to let us know that the only deposit that he requires is that you love him. He don't ask for a whole lot of money. He don't ask for you to pay all the months that you was not paying rent. He just asks for you to come in and go forward. Because we're justified by faith. And he gives us peace. And he furnishes the whole place. Now y'all know God is a good God. He, you don't have to go out and buy your own furniture. He'll furnish it with peace. He'll furnish it with faith. He'll furnish it with justifying us. He'll, just, he'll turn around and, and, and fill up the house with grace. He'll give us hope. Not only so, but we glory in tribulations in verse 3. And knowing that tribulation worketh patience. He give us patience. So that we don't walk out on him the next time. He furnished the whole house with some patience. So we'll stay a little longer. He furnishes it with, with some patience. So we'll wait on him to take us through our tribulations. All of this is a result of this, this charity that he, he gives us. Because we have access now. Patience in verse 4. And patience experience. We got some experience when we walked out on our lease. But we're back now. Somebody say I'm back now. Experience hope. He gives us hope when we move in. Amen. He furnishes the house with hope. And, and the hope in verse 5, it makes us not ashamed. Because God is so good. He don't make you be ashamed that you walked out on your lease. But he just lets you move right back on in. And he done furnished the place with good things. He can give you charity, agape love. He's given us all these different things. And then he turns around and lets us live there condemnation free. He don't make you feel bad. Well, you walked out on your lease. I should charge you back payments. You should be beholden to me for all these payments. You, you've been gone 18 months. Who you think was paying the rent while you was gone? I still had to pay my mortgage. But he's not like that. He just blots it out. He just blots it all out. And makes us not ashamed. Why? Because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. And it's in his heart. And it's because of the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. He does this because in verse 6 it says, For when we were yet without strength. Some of us may have had more strength than others. Some of us may have thought, well, I'm never going to get myself back in to move. He's never going to let me move back in. He's never going to take me back. But charity, I'm going to jump back over there. For yet, when we were without strength, he knew we moved out. He knew that we left hastily. He knew that we didn't wait on him. He knew we didn't have no patience. He knew that our hope was gone. He knew that we needed to be justified again. He knew our peace was just up in the air. It was failing. It was fleeting. He knew all of these things that we were going through tribulations. He knew all of that. But he says, for when we were yet without strength, all of that stuff didn't matter that we walked out on the lease. It didn't matter. He said, it didn't even matter when we were yet without strength. Think about, you can fill in the blank in your own mind. When you were without strength, what did you do when you didn't have this charity? What did you do? What did I do? Fill in the blank in my own mind and in my own spirit. But he knew. Somebody say he knew. For when we were without strength, yet without strength, the word says. In due time, somebody say in due time. Christ died for the ungodly. In other words, when I didn't have the love of God shed abroad in my heart, I was ungodly. When I didn't have this charity, as I flip over to 1 Corinthians 13 again, I was ungodly. But Christ still died. And he still let me pick the lease back up where I left off. Ain't too many landlords going to do that. They're not going to let you move back in when they know how you left them off. But Christ said, Paul said over in Romans, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Yet, when I was without strength. Everything that you have done and I have done before I received the love of God, it was because I was without strength. It was because you were without strength. But Christ knew that. He says, and yet, he still did it. Amen? 
Amen. The Bible says in Romans, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk, but, but it has stipulations, who walk not after the flesh. The condemnation ceases when I stop walking after the flesh, and I'm getting back to charity, I am. But the condemnation ceases when I stop walking after the flesh. There's a condition. If you want condemnation to leave, then there's a change in direction you must go. Condemnation flees when you change your direction. Condemnation flees. The Spirit said, write that one down. Condemnation flees when you change direction. Amen? Condemnation flees. You say, well, what does it have to do with charity? I'm, I'm getting back to it. Condemnation flees when we change direction. It does not have an opportunity to flee if you're going in the same direction. If you want something to be different, you have to do something different. In order for, you know, people talk about the definition of insanity. It's doing the same thing over and over, expecting a different result. That's the definition of insanity. But if you want something to change, you have to do something different. If you want to change or be changed, you have to do something different. Amen? And so Paul over here in 13 and 4, I'm jumping into 1 Corinthians. Now we're back on charity. Amen? Charity suffereth long. Yet when we were without strength, Christ died for the ungodly. Because he was suffering long with us. He knew all the things we would be exposed to. Charity suffered long. Are you suffering long with your brother and sister? Are you suffering long? And this, I'm going to turn to the wall for this. Are you suffering long with yourself? And y'all got quiet. I don't even hear a pen fall in here. Are you suffering long with yourself? What do I even mean by that? Pastor Harris, what do I mean by that? Suffer long with yourself. When I think about it, it's recognizing where we are in the Lord and allowing the Spirit to change us instead of being short with ourselves or giving up or getting upset with ourselves or allowing that condemnation that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. So if, if I wasn't suffering long with myself, um, let's say my shortcoming is suffering long with myself, I'd be upset and it would cause me to go in the opposite direction. Maybe I'll give up, maybe I'll just be mad and angry. My peace will be stolen. But if I suffer long with myself, then I'll say, Lord, you know what? I really need you to help me with this. And I'll have peace about it and kindness will still be there as the Lord is helping me with that. The same way if it was suffering long with somebody else, instead of me being upset with them and being short with them, I have peace and kindness with them. Because sometimes we do more harm with ourselves because we don't suffer long and realize that it's a process. It's a day by day. Say that a word again. It's a process. It's a process. And it's a day by day, and the Lord has to work on us. So we have to suffer long with our own frailty and our own shortcomings and allow the Spirit to work on us. I couldn't have put it any better, sir. One of the biggest pitfalls, if we're not careful, is the enemy will cause us to not suffer long with ourselves long before we can't suffer long with other people. Yeah. I want to encourage you. If you're the type of person that you're hard on yourself, give yourself what God, what, what, what did Romans say? I'm going to jump back over there real quick. This, this is the expectation. Somebody needs this this morning. This is the expectation over in Romans 5. He says over here, patience in verse 4. Patience, experience, and experience hope. You have to be patient with yourself. Because God is patient with you. I'm not preaching and teaching this morning that you don't have to live free from sin. I don't want nobody to get it twisted and get it all confused. There is an expectation for you to live holy. Let me put my disclaimer out there. But this is a process. And if you think that... You're going to have it all together, all at once. And the enemy is not going to tempt you. He's not going to do this and not going to do that. 
you are too um, hard on yourself and you're not being long-suffering. Is that saying run out there and go do everything that you shouldn't do because God's got grace and he's long-suffering? No, that's not what I'm saying. But if you've been in the world, however many years you've been in the world, and you come to Christ, you need to give him some time to work things out of you and to work things in you. That's why he says, when he talks about being justified by faith and having peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, he's, he's saying this is all through the Lord Jesus Christ. This, ain't, this is not all through you. You get what you need through the Lord Jesus Christ. Your justification comes by Jesus Christ. It doesn't mean that you are a, 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 um, someone who's just an observer. You have to actively work with him because you have to actively yield to him so that he can actually change you. It is a partnership now, but you're not the one doing all the work. Therefore, when you realize you're not doing all the work, you can actually have patience and long-suffering with yourself. And that gives room for the condemnation to flee. Amen? Condemnation has to have a, a partner, just like all the things in Romans 5 has to have a partner. You are the person or the partner that they need. If you want to walk after the flesh, the flesh is the partner. Amen? But if you want to walk after the spirit, the spirit needs you to be its partner. We have to make a decision which way we're going to go. And in that decision back over in 1 Corinthians 13, we have to suffer long. Long before you can really be truly long-suffering with somebody else, you have to learn how to be long-suffering with yourself. Many of us, even culturally speaking, we have a hard time being long-suffering because of different things that we've gone through in our lives. So we may want this to happen right now. This change to happen right now. I don't want to think about this right now. I don't want to feel this way right now. I don't want to know this about this right now. I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to. But I do want this to happen in this time and so on and so forth. Patience is synonymous with long-suffering. And so it has to suffer long. When the love of God, this charity Paul is talking about, when that charity comes in, it will cause you to be patient. When you would speak, that charity will say, don't say nothing. Brighter your tongue. Keep it under subjection. James talks about the tongue being an unruly member. The tongue can kill as well as give life. We have to choose which one we want to give. Sometimes it's not good to say because it takes away from the long suffering that the Lord is trying to give us. It takes away from us being able to reflect on what God is doing. We have to be long-suffering even in the event of saying something or not saying something. That may be a challenge for some of us. Not saying something. Holding our peace. Holding our tongue. It's not always time to talk. Amen? I had to learn that. I'm talk Y'all look at me like I'm talking about y'all. Look, when you're in the pulpit, you got, if you think that the pastor or the sister pastor or whoever the person is up, it's talking about you. You got to think, if I'm pointing one finger at you or two fingers, I got three fingers left. Where they going? Right? Y'all see this, right? Where, where are these other three fingers going? Back to me. I got to be able to, to, to receive what I'm giving. Long before I give it to you, believe me, I, I have to receive it. I ain't telling you what I heard. I'm telling you what I know and what I have experienced. Pastor Harris. have to really equate how we would, when we see faults in somebody else, one of the first things uh, a good brother or sister do is ask the Lord to help that person. Mm -hmm. So with whatever little knowledge you have, even if you just know you're not supposed to curse, and you see somebody cursing, and a good person say, well, well Lord, help that person stop cursing, and they'll be long-suffering with them, just, just in general. Mm -hmm. like, Lord, just help them. But when it comes to being long-suffering with ourselves, the key to that is asking the Lord to help us help ourselves. And 
it's not somebody else saying, Lord, help pass away. But it, it's, it's me when, when whatever it is, that if it was somebody else being long suffering with me, mm-hmm. I need to be able to say the same thing about myself, to myself, and to the Lord. And that's, that's where that, that change comes, is like just how you said, the things that you're telling us, you had to receive it first. Mm. So by receiving it means is that you had to take all this to the Lord for yourself. And you had to say, well, Lord, help me to have the kindness. Help me to have the charity. And that's being long-suffering. Mm-hmm. And that's a part of knowing how, how you are and how you are in the sight of God. Amen. And so that's, that's what I was thinking about when you said that. Um, and it, it should be a burden in yourself for yourself. Just like we can have for somebody else to be long suffering, say, Lord, Lord, help me not to say anything, um, because we know that the Lord, if He wasn't long suffering with us, maybe He would have threw us away when we said something the last time we went to pray. pray. Mm-hmm. So we have to acknowledge that and offer that to Him first. That's that's. Thank you for that, sir. Um, I will tell you, and I don't know the spirit is lingering here, um, but I will tell you that that was one of my biggest challenges. And can still sometimes be is saying things when I don't need to say them, and we probably all run into that from time to time. Um, but for me, that was a was and is sometimes a big one for me, being able to hold my peace. Because one time, a long time ago, um, um, it, it, uh, somebody told me they said, um, when and 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 they said even when I'm in prayer, they said it's good for me to speak in tongues. Um, because as the book of Jude says that you build up your most holy faith praying in the Holy Ghost. So you're just praying in the Spirit, speaking in tongues. But sometimes during the prayer time, the Spirit also wants to speak. And then I might have to be silent. And then the same thing in the natural when I'm up on my feet. Uh, they told me a long time ago that if I'm always speaking, when am I listening? If I'm always speaking... When am I listening? Because listening is very active. You have to actively listen. So if I'm always speaking, when am I listening? And I took that into my spirit and I was like, ouch. Because I was like, oof, was that charity? But it was, the, it was charity because charity suffers long. And charity was suffering long with me. The love of God was suffering long with me because he was allowing me to get to a point where I was self-aware. But in that area, I didn't get it. Somebody had to tell me. I wasn't that self-aware. One of the biggest things that hinders us in our walk in Christ is not being self-aware. And that self-awareness really is not us being self-aware. It's really once you become a, a, a child of God, it's really the spirit aware. Like the spirit making us aware. It turns from being self-aware to the spirit making you aware. He comes in and he couples with you, helps you to be aware. Because before, it was incumbent upon me to be self-aware of what I was doing, what I was saying, what I was thinking, how I was acting, because I didn't have no help. Or when it seems like I would have help, it was negative help that the devil would send for people to down me and disparage me. But the benefit of having the Holy Ghost is that when he comes in, you no longer have to depend and lean on your own understanding, as Proverbs 3 and 5 says, but you have help to make you spiritually aware. You go from having to be always self-aware to being spiritually aware. And the spirit will come in and say, "You, yeah, you messed up. You said too much. You shouldn't have said this. You shouldn't have said that. You shouldn't have done this. You shouldn't have done that by saying X, Y, and Z. This is the result of what's, what's happened because you said this. But he's teaching me to be quiet at the right time. Because when I'm quiet... I can hear the spirit, and then I'm being able to to, to be long-suffering with myself because I would beat myself up very badly about when I'm saying things and I shouldn't say them. But I'm learning to wait and listen to the spirit so that I can hear him so that I can go in the right direction or not go at all, not move at all, not do at all. Amen? Charity is Charity suffers long and is kind, and I'm going to be wrapping up in a few it envieth not. Charity is not jealous of anybody or anything. Charity isn't offended if someone else, my brother or my sister, gets blessed. Charity is not offended if this person has and I don't. 
Charity is not envious at all. Because that's not the love of God. It vaunteth not itself. Charity is not puffed up. It doesn't try to make a reputation of itself. It doesn't try to prove itself. It doesn't try to uh, exalt itself to try to make it seem like it's bigger and better than what it is. Charity is humble. The opposite of all these things that Paul just mentioned in verse 4. Charity is humble. And charity doesn't have a problem with being humble. It's one thing to be humble because you feel like, well, I'm not in this position, so I can't say nothing. I, I'm, I'm not, you know, I can't say nothing to this, that, and the other. But that doesn't mean it's the right kind of humility. We want the love of God and we want the power of God and the humility of God. That's what charity becomes. Becomes us, amen? It does not behave itself unseemly. And that one seems to be easy. But sometimes we don't realize being unseemly could be um, in the small things. A lot of times we think about being unseemly or acting out or doing stuff we shouldn't do. Unseemly, we think about it in large things. Well, I didn't cuss around the pastor. Or I didn't, I didn't say this around so-and-so. You know, I know she's an elder. You know, I didn't do X, Y, Z. But what about when we're not around the people of God? What are we doing to be unseemly? Are our thoughts unseemly? Are actions unseemly? It does not behave itself unseemly, not just around the people of God, but on the job, in the supermarket, with the family, because that's a big one. How do we act around our family? I'm trying to gauge my life in such a way that if I'm around my family, that if the saints of God are around, the saints of God can see me in the same light that they see me in the church. If I'm not doing that, I'm actually being unseemly. And that might seem like a small thing, but it's a big thing in the eyes of God. How am I acting when I'm around my family who may not be filled with the spirit? Unseemly, amen? Seeketh not her own. In other words, I'm not jockeying for position. I'm not push, pushing my agenda. I'm not doing any of those things, seeking my own. I'm only seeking what God wants me to do. And I'm only seeking what he wants me to have. What are we seeking today? Are we seeking our own? position, whether it's in the world, whether it's in, what is it even in the world that lo, that the Lord wants you to have? Because you may be seeking after a certain type of position, but is that your own or is that the Lord's way of, for you to go? Amen? And it's the same way within the house of God. Seeking not our own. I'm not an assistant pastor because I asked to be one. I'm an assistant pastor because the Lord said that he wanted me to be one. And the word came for me to be one. The Lord gave, did not give me the word to be the pastor of this church. The Lord gave the words for the man of God years ago through the bishop that he was going to be a pastor. I was like, that's fine with me. Okay, I'll do what you want me to do. Seeking not my own. When you don't seek your own and you accept, the problem is we got to accept the will of God. We know what the will of God is a lot of times. The problem is not knowing. The problem is accepting. Charity helps you to accept. Amen. It's not about knowing. A lot of people know what they're supposed to be. This church should be full this morning. A lot of people know they're supposed to be in church, y'all. Come on now. Let's be real. We know we're supposed to be in the house of God. Ain't nobody confused. Jesus said, for this cause where we born. For this end we came into the world. We know. But it's not about knowing. It's about accepting. Amen. And so it's seeking not our own, not easily provoked. Thinketh no evil, not easily provoked. Think about yourself. What does it take to push your buttons? What does it take? Not easily provoked. Not easily provoked. What does it take to fly off on the deep end? What does it take to cause me not to want to come to the house of God? We don't even realize the enemy does that to us too. He'll provoke us not to want to pray. Oh, that so-and-so got on my nerves on the job today. I ain't going to church. Oh, so-and-so got on my nerves. I ain't going to pray today. So so got my nerve. I don't want to see Pastor. He better not call me. Easily provoked. Don't let the enemy provoke you out of your salvation. I'm going to say that again. Jesus is coming, y'all. Whether we like it or not, whether we want to or want him to or not, whether we ready or not, Jesus is still coming. Don't let the enemy provoke you out of your salvation. Don't be easily provoked. Because we have this love of God. 
that should be in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. And that outweighs the provocation. That outweighs that. But what happens is we choose the provocation over what we have over here. And the Spirit is making us spiritually aware of what is going on. Don't be easily provoked. The enemy knows what's in store for you. That's why he provokes you. Amen? Think of no evil. Well, we know who tries to put that on us. Ask the Lord if you think an evil that... I'm going to say this real quick, and I'm, I'm, I'm really ramping down. But I know we got late started, so I'm ramping down, though. But think about this. Um, think of no evil. The enemy, I'm going to tell you, this is how he works. When you get ready to leave the church today, the devil is going to try you to think about, before you even get out the door good, he's going to try to steal what you got in Christian education. He's going to try to steal what you got in service and replace it with something evil. And he will disguise it as if it's something godly. Anything that the devil will do to come in and try to make you forget or not grab hold or let sink into your spirit what you got in service, and it was the truth of the word of the Lord, that is causing you to think evil because he's trying to come in. And you might say, well, he brought a scripture to my mind. Is it related to the message? Is it related to what God wants you to do? Is it related to the things that God gave in the word today? At that time, is it related? Or is it some foreign thought that don't have nothing to do with nothing? The devil used the word of God against Eve too. Y'all remember that, right? Didn't he come and try to preach to Jesus too when he was tempting him? But that wasn't what the Lord would have him to hear at that time. Amen? So be careful about what you think and when you think it. Ponder on what you get today. Don't allow the enemy to let you lose as soon as you go out the building the fowls of the air or before you get up out your seat, the fowls of the air. Come in and take away what God has given you because it's designed to sustain you. The word is from service to service, from prayer to prayer. So if you leave out and you don't think about nothing that, was come, that came forth today, the enemy has come in and replaced what you got with evil. Amen? Rejoice is not in iniquity. I'm getting to the bottom of this so we can close. Rejoice is not in iniquity. In other words, don't, don't, don't rejoice in sin. It's simple as that. Don't rejoice in it. We, we shouldn't rejoice in it because that's not charity. Amen? But rejoiceth in the truth. In other words, you delight yourselves in the love of God and in the truth of the word of God. Beareth all things. As I'm getting to the bottom, beareth all things. You're not able to bear all things by yourself. That's not what he's saying. What he is saying is that he's talking about charity. If we're following along here, the love of God, the power of God can cause you to bear all things. You can't bear it by yourself. You will fail. I will be very candid with you. You, you and I will fail. But bearing all things consists of being in partnership with the Holy Spirit, letting him help you. Amen? Letting him, because you got to accept that you can't bear all things by yourself. And a lot of us go through needlessly because we have been trying to do that. I want to encourage you this morning. You don't have to bear all things by yourself. It's not even for you because the Bible says, and I think pastor was teaching about this or preaching about this. He said, I'll send you another comforter. The comforter is supposed to bear all those things. He's supposed to do that. The comforter is supposed to do that. Amen. And if you allow him to help you bear all things, then you will have the strength to believe all things, as the scripture says. You, you, you trying to bear all things will make you stop believing all things pertaining to the word of God. That's what he, he's talking about. The, he's talking about here when he says bear all things. That's through the Holy Spirit. I'm going to tell you, I'm, I'm sitting here with a church full of mighty men. Y'all have this tendency, as I have seen over time, men do. You can correct me if I'm wrong. But y'all y'all just be trying to bear stuff. Just be, just, just be bearing it. Well, then it manifests itself in your physical body because you can get sick and you can break down and all these things. But you weren't physically designed nor spiritually designed nor mentally designed or emotionally designed to bear all things. So Paul is saying here, I'm just going to put in the parentheses, spiritual parentheses, 
bear all things with the help of the spirit, not in your own bodies and in your own mind. Stop trying to bear these things by yourself. And when we don't lean on the Lord, we're bearing them ourselves. I'm sorry. But when we're leaning on him, we don't realize he's the one caring and bearing. Mm -hmm. It's a choice. Sometimes we go through because we want to go through. And y'all might be like, ouch. Somebody told, uh, th through the spirit, I, I received that one time. Said so you don't have to go through. You do know that, sister. I mean, not in every situation. Now, there's some things that are ordered, you know, some things that happen. But in every situation, some situations is self-inflicted wounds because I won't allow the spirit to help me. It's a choice, amen? So we can bear all things through the spirit, which helps us to believe all things. And believing all things, meaning all things pertaining to life and godliness, amen, in Christ Jesus. And then that turns around, it's like a formula. It turns around and helps me to hope all things. So now that I know I have somebody to help me bear them, and then I have someone that can help me believe, then I have hope, and then I can hope in all things pertaining to the Lord. And then lastly, endureth all things. You cannot endure all things by yourself because the Holy Spirit is there to do that and help you to do that for you. Amen? So I want you to be encouraged this morning that charity is very comprehensive, but it's very plain. What, I ask the questions, why am I doing what I'm doing? What is my motive for serving the Lord? And then the last question is, how should I serve the Lord? And I didn't write that on the board, amen? But I will as we close. How? And, and the way that we should be serving the Lord is through charity, amen? That's all I have for you this morning.